Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Sam Ankerson. I'm the director of the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum, and we're very glad you've joined us for tonight's lecture. Let's get cracking cephalopods coast to coast with Brett Grassi from the Marine uh, Biological Laboratories in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And we're thrilled to have Brett with us tonight and thank him for joining us. He is a, a great specialist in the, the many species of cephalopods, an advocate for them, an educator, uh, a researcher, and he, uh, as you'll find in this in this great talk, um, he'll illuminate um, all kinds of aspects of these of these amazing animals, which uh, you know we see in a in a in a smaller way here at the museum every day of the of the sixty plus marine uh, marine life species we have on exhibit. Uh, it's the cephalopods, you know, the octopuses, the cuttlefish um, that so consistently um, just pe that people connect with and are fascinated by and just can spend so much time um, watching. And um, they're amazing animals and Brett will, Brett will uh, help, us, help us dive into um, um, all of that. Um, also, he'll share some of the, uh, uh, some of the interesting things, the, the work that he and his colleagues do at the laboratories um, to, you know, on behalf of the species and on behalf of educating uh, people about them and working for, um, working for their conservation and, and for their betterment. Um, before, before we get to, um, to, to introducing Brett and starting the talk, I um, uh, wanted to uh, thank our sponsors for our, our summer and fall lecture series, Mark and Kathy Helge. And uh, this is the the second in the series. It's um, obviously here we all are. It's a it's a Zoom series, and uh, these are these are monthly lectures. Uh, in August, uh, our own science director and curator Jose Leal and Dr. Uh, Rudiger Beiler from the Field Museum in Chicago will be giving a talk on a project they've been working on to uh, to document uh, the the sp uh, the spread the the distribution I should say of of mollusks on the eastern seaboard. It's a project they're working on with with several universities and museums around the country. And in September, Dr. Megan Camp, who is has been leading a project for almost forty years now to um, to build sustainable. Um, aquaculture facilities in the Caribbean for, uh, for the Queen Conch. She'll be talking about that. And in October, Dr. Jan Vendetti from the Los Angeles Museum, uh, LA County Museum of Natural History. will talk about a really interesting project that she's been working on for seven years, uh, engaging the citizenry of, of Los Angeles in, in a citizen science project um, to, to document land snail uh, distribution in in LA and and observations on on how they're doing in urban urban environments generally. So uh, can register for all of those online shellmuseum.org. Uh, they're free. And uh, and I would mention too that uh, tonight's lecture, any past uh, Zoom lecture we've had, including you know we did we did a, a big series in 2021, they're all available uh, to view. Uh, are archived and available to view on the museum's website. Um, so they're they're preserved in posterity, and um, and you're welcome to to view them at any time. As you have questions, if you have questions tonight during Brett's talk, please use the chat function, which is uh, along the the bottom of your screen. If you move your your cursor along the bottom, there's chat. Click on that. Type in your questions. Um, after after the slide presentation, we'll we'll have time for questions, and I'll and we'll 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 take those then. Write in your questions anytime, and um, and we'll look forward to to answering them at the end of, of Brett's presentation. And so then now it's my pleasure to to formally introduce Brett Grassi, who uh, has been working in public aquariums for over 15 years now. He's currently the manager of cephalopod operations at Marine Biological Laboratories in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Prior to that, he, he worked for 10 years at the Monterey Bay Aquarium in California, where among other things, he created 
uh, the, the world's first large scale cephalopod show called uh, Tentacles and which featured over 50 species of cephalopods, a major, major achievement. And, um, and he, he came to uh, Marine Biological Laboratories a couple years ago and his work there includes uh, perpetuating, um, spreading, disseminating education um, on these species. And, you know, one way that that happens is by providing them to educational organizations such as our museum um, so that they can be exhibited and interpreted um, for the public. And in fact, we've, um, we've uh, you know, some cuttlefish and squids um, that have been on view here have, have come um, from, from Brett and from MBL, which is how we, how we got to know Brett. So, and then uh, lastly, I would just say, and in addition to being a, an interesting and great guy, uh, Brett has twin one-year-old kids. So, um, I mean, you know, if, uh, if all this good work wasn't, wasn't enough, he is, he is one busy guy with, um, with his hands full for sure. So we're, we're especially glad that he was able to take some time to, to prepare this presentation and to join us tonight. So without further ado, um, I will uh, introduce Brett Grassi. Thanks, Brett. All right. Thanks, Sam. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks to everyone for, for uh, joining me today. It's my absolute privilege and, and honor to be here talking about my favorite group of animals, and that's cephalopods. And so uh, for the purposes of this talk, um, we're going to be, oops, let's see here. We're going to be going through uh, a, a quick personal background. Um, we'll then be kind of introducing what makes a cephalopod, what makes a cephalopod a cephalopod. I'm going to then take you all back in time and uh, kind of talk about the history of cephalopods and what made them such a phenomenally successful uh, group of organisms dating way back millions of years and, and to present day. I will then talk about what cephalopods look like today and the general divisions of our various uh, cephalopods around the globe, and then kind of wrap up really quickly with uh, cephalopods and their role in aquariums and research. So we've got a lot to cover today, but we'll uh, try to get through it as quick as we can. And I hope you all uh, enjoy the, the subject matter. So as a quick personal background, as Sam mentioned, um, I spent the past, um, previous to joining the MBL, I spent the past 10 years as a senior aquarist at the Monterey Bay Aquarium in beautiful Monterey, California, where uh, we launched the world's first large scale cephalopod exhibition, which we called Tentacles. Uh, it was a great um, uh, uh, labor, labor of love for, from a lot of different people, not only myself, but a lot of really talented coworkers and colleagues at that aquarium. And we um, worked with, uh, through the research and development and launch of the show, as Sam mentioned, over 50 different species from deep sea species of vampire squids to our, our more familiar shallow water species as well. And a lot of that work uh, was predicated on being able to keep them very healthy and in great condition and then culture them through, through their life, through their various, um, life phases, and then through multiple generations. And so through that work and through those successes and experiences, I was recruited to come over to the Marine Biological Laboratory in, uh, again, beautiful Cape Cod, Massachusetts on the other coast to um, spearhead the, a, a new type of generation of cephalopod science by creating genetically tractable cephalopods uh, to support various research, conservation, and other general outreach. And so we believe here that cephalopods are leading the way to new and unprecedented discoveries. And hopefully you'll agree with me after we kind of talk a little bit more about cephalopods. So we've heard the word cephalopod a lot, um, but what exactly makes a cephalopod a cephalopod? I realize that some of our audience members may not be as well versed as others. So I'd like to take it just a couple steps back to make sure we're all on the same page. And generally speaking, cephalopods on our planet today are divided into these four major categories, which are octopuses, cuttlefish, squids, and nautilus, all very different. But all of them do possess uh, similar features in that they are all marine mollusks. So they all are part of phyla mollusca. Um, although octopuses, squids, cuttlefish, and nautiluses look quite a bit different from more familiar mollusks that you might think of like snails, clams, et cetera, they do still possess similar anatomical features like um, a large mantle that holds all of their organs. They have a toothed tongue called a radula, which you can see over on the right side there, that's concealed within their beak. And that's how they, they um, consume their food and use it to kind of scrape meat out of you know, crab shells and things like that. 
Uh, radulas are also conserved within the other uh, mollusca uh, organisms. The term cephalopod itself means head foot. It's a Greek derivative word. So uh, for those of you who have had the ongoing debate, whether it's octopi or octopuses, be rest assured it is octopuses. It would be octopi if it was Latin. So octopuses is the true uh, plural, um, head foot. You can kind of see some of the hypotheses as far as how the evolution of cephalopods came to be where, you know, starting off as more traditional mollusk with a shell and that large foot as uh, evolution continues kind of leading into those differentiated arms and tentacles that we see in present day cephalopods. Um, cephalopods as a group are incredibly diverse. There's about 800 different species of cephalopods on our planet uh, currently, coming from a wide variety of different sizes and shapes. Everything from these tiny Japanese pygmy squid, which as full grown adults are no larger than a jelly bean, to the, uh, the, large, uh, the large giant squid, which can be over 40 feet long, um, that we know of. They could even be bigger than that. They're just very rarely observed. So um, large diversity in size between these different types of squids. And also, you know, the massive colossal, colossal squid, which is also rarely observed. Uh, this is one of the rare um, videos from fishermen down in uh, Antarctica that have captured one alive. Um, so, um, and then, you know, we, we know more of our traditional octopuses and more, you know, nautiluses, more traditional body plants, but then there's also absolutely gorgeous cephalopods out there that maybe some of you haven't seen before, like this blanket octopus, which is native to deep waters in the Indonesia uh, region. Um, this is a female, just absolutely gorgeous, like something out of a, out of a movie. So incredibly diverse. They're also found in every ocean. So um, cephalopods are spanning across our entire planet. They can be found from, you know, shallow tide pools as pictured in the upper left there to, to over five miles down beneath our, our seawater surface to, to into the depths. Um, and everywhere from, you know, the extremely warm temper temperature climate of the equator and, and, you know, those tropics to to the Antarctic and Arctic uh, conditions where some cephalopods have been found in waters even as cold as negative two degrees Celsius. So, so um, a very diverse uh, group of animals. And they're also very important within our oceans. So when we think of cephalopods role in our oceans, now, not, you know, now that we know that they are in every ocean, um, some of you may think you know, of that connection, that historic connection of the kraken and the ships and the, the whales and their battle with the giant squid. Um, which is completely true, and, and um, squids do um, fill a very important food source for a lot of these animals. In fact, there was a sperm whale that was recently autopsied, and, and it showed to have over 15,000 squid beaks in its stomach. So very, very important for those types of, of animals, but they're also very important for a lot of other animals as well, like um, albatross that are, you know, open ocean birds uh, for other seabirds, like, um, you know, uh, seagulls and and other types of shorebirds. Um, sharks certainly will eat squids. They're pure protein, very little fat. Uh, there's a lot of marine mammals like sea lions and dolphins that rely on cephalopods as an important food source. Uh, food source. Also, even terrestrial predators will, will opportunistically dine on cephalopods. Um, scavengers uh, will feed on cephalopods. You know, cephalopods in general have a very short life cycle. Um, mo most cephalopods live only about a year or less naturally. And so this provides a lot of opportunity for scavengers and other types of animals to eat them as well. Um, of course, humans, we eat them. Uh, lots of things eat them. Even squids eat squids. So uh, cephalopods will eat themselves. They, they um, will also eat a wide variety of other types of prey. So um, when considering their role, their larger role in the ocean's ecosystem, and not only in the ocean's ecosystem, but the food webs as it even pertains to us here in our terrestrial world, we can see how critically important they are for our oceans and to conserve them as a group. Okay, so now that we know what cephalopods are, uh, let's take a, a little trip back in time and let's go uh, back several hundred millions of years and kind of learn where cephalopods came from. Um, so our last common ancestor with cephalopods was about 550 million years ago. Now this is uh, way before any sort of humans or apes. This is way before the dinosaurs ever existed. This is even before any sort of land life at all. No plants, nothing really existed on land um, 
And that was where our last common ancestor existed, was some sort of flattened worm hypothesized to be around maybe 500 or 600 million years ago. And since then, there was a massive division in life on planet Earth, you know, one branch giving rise to the dinosaurs, mammoths, the great ape, us, and then the other branch giving rise to things like arthropods, insects, coral, and cephalopods. Cephalopods, however, though, are a very unique group in that they possess very advanced cognitive, behavioral, and physiological capabilities um, that are not found in any other invertebrates. So they've kind of um, evolved kind of a place of their own, and we'll kind of talk about that on a few other slides in the future. So going back in time here, um, we want to kind of paint the picture of what life looked like before, uh, before there was terrestrial plants and other life on, on land. Um, and back in these days, um, there was mostly, mostly all the life, actually all of the life was um, primarily reserved down on the benthos, the ocean floor. Um, and mollusks were really some of the first complex organisms that really existed, uh, several of which had shells and other things. Um, and that's really kind of the, the root at where cephalopods came from. And cephalopods did something different that really made them stand up from all the other mollusks, all the other organisms back in this day and age. And this very important thing that they did was they utilized a shell. And that may not be impressive to you, but more, uh, but very importantly to them, it wasn't just any shell, it was a, a chambered shell. And a chambered shell um, allowed cephalopods to really change the oceans uh, forever. And it really allowed them to become the most dominant life form on our planet during that time. And what the chambered shell did was it allowed this little fellow, which is uh, hypothesized to be one of the first cephalopods, the um, uh, Plectronoceros. This little guy um, had this chambered shell, as you can kind of see from these renditions, where it had these various um, kind of uh, uh, sections, which we call septa, that were laid down as the animal grew. And as it grew, um, it laid down another chamber, and more and more chambers were connected by this internal uh, little thin piece of tissue called a siphuncle. Now that siphuncle connected all of these tubes and by, um, by transferring very, very uh, salty kind of liquid through that siphuncle, it actually pulled all of the liquid out of those chambers, replacing that liquid with air from the blood and thus making those chambers empty and light. And so back in the day, um, the, the cephalopod's shell was its greatest advantage because it protected that, that soft mantle, all those important organs. But it was also its biggest disadvantage because it was very heavy and cumbersome to move around. So for the first time, this little Plectronoceros was able to empty those chambers and for the first time kind of lift up off the bottom, making it much, much lighter. And that changed everything for this group of animals. Since then, um, they began to diversify and expand their different body plans and forms and become wildly successful at consuming all of the other mollusks that lived down there. Um, and some of them had these types of spiral shells and different types of coiled shells. And we really started seeing a lot of cephalopod diversity as the oceans warmed and a lot more of this food abundance became more prevalent. In fact, it, they became so successful that they were the biggest animals on our planet at that time. In fact, some uh, of our large cephalopods like Camaroceros here were so large that they reached sizes of even uh, six meters or 20 feet long. So just to put in perspective, you can see the silhouette of the, di uh, the diver. These were truly the dominant life forms back uh, in these days. And again, they came in a wide variety of different sizes and shapes, some with these very coiled um, shells, some with even shells that looked like paper clips like this. And these are actual, there were actual fossilized records of shells that existed in these very bizarre and unusual body plans. So Cephalopods really took off and they were very successful and life was good for a cephalopod if you were a cephalopod. And everything was great until a little period called the Mesozoic Marine Revolution where these large fast vertebrates started evolving extremely rapidly and it became a bit of an arms race against our cephalopods to see who could, uh, who could win out and, be, and truly become the dominant life form in our ocean. So all of a sudden our cephalopods were a bit uh, on edge and their, their otherwise strong shells were now being able to be crushed by these large fast swimming jawed vertebrates. And for the first time, our cephalopods were in a bit of trouble. So as that evolutionary arms race continued, our cephalopods changed their body plan. They changed their shape. A lot of their shells became more streamlined. They became thinner. 
Uh, and with that um, created greater velocity and maneuverability and, um, and kind of jet propulsion with these animals. It allowed them to evade these large vertebrate predators and allowed them to continue being successful. Um, but that also changed their body plan into what we see as present day cephalopods today. And what we see today for our present day cephalopods are these absolutely gorgeous, soft bodied, very flexible, very dexterous sort of animals that have come up with their own set of very successful anti-predatory mechanisms. In life, uh, in cephalopods today, life um, is generally divided into two major subclasses, And this is where I'm gonna kind of talk about some of the specific groups and organization of our cephalopods uh, currently. And our cephalopods are, are right now classified by two general subclasses, our nautiloids, which are our only remaining com um, completely external shelled cephalopods. So as you can see from the photo here, they do have the external shell. They have that large fleshy hood that they can conceal their, all their tentacles in with. They've got an open, simple eye with uh, uh, no lens. They've got around 90 tentacles without any suckers on them. So very different from some of our other cephalopods. They've got an unfused funnel that they use to scoot around uh, in, in the water column, and they only have one single heart. So these are sort of more aligned with what some of the other ancient shelled cephalopods looked like, uh, both internally and externally. Now, our other subclass are, are coleoids, which do not have any sort of shell. They are, uh, their shell has either been internalized, um, like the cuttlefish, which we'll talk about in a little bit, it's been reduced or it's been lost completely. Um, they don't have any sort of fleshy hood. They do have a camera-like eye like we do with a, a large lens that focuses an image onto a retina. Um, they've got uh, only eight to 10 limbs, depending on whether you're a cuttlefish, squid, or an octopus. They've got a fused funnel to, again, aid in that jet propulsion and increase their mobility. And they also have three hearts, one central heart to provide for the the general cephalopod, and then two brachial hearts to provide blood for the gill. So a very kind of different sort of body plan with our more present day evolved cephalopods. And if we look at our present day cephalopods, they're generally broken down into these seven uh, groups. Uh, we've got, uh, and those two, those seven groups belong to two kind of larger groups, vampyromorpha and then our decabranchs. Our vampyromorpha only have eight arms, uh, no, uh, no tentacles, and they uh, are composed of, of a few different groups. One is the inserata, which is what you would maybe think of as your more um, traditional cephalopod, you know, the eight arms, or sorry, traditional octopus. The eight arms, the two rows of suckers, a lot of great dexterity. They've got the ability to ink um, and they have absolutely um, lost that internal shell. Whereas our Syra octopus, um, they uh, do have still an internal cartilaginous, cartilaginous shell. They have still have retained to have these two fins to aid in some of their locomotion. And their sucker arrangement is a bit different. This video down in the bottom is us collecting one um, with our colleagues in Bari back in our Monterey when we were uh, displaying, uh, pioneer displaying this species for the first time. Um, just for scale reference, this is, um, uh, this is me holding one in the cold room. So they're about the flapjack octopus in particular is about the size of um, a baseball. Although some of the Dumbo octopus in the larger series can get to be, you know, the size of a, of a basketball uh, somewhere around there. So a, a, a little bit different um, group of animals compared to our more traditional shallow water octopuses, more familiar octopuses. And then we've got Vampyromorpha, which to me is one of the coolest cephalopods out there. Um, they're the only fil filter feeding cephalopod that we know of. Um, they have these two long feeding filaments so you can see pictured here uh, on the still photo. These are modified tentacles that they use to basically catch marine snow, all the stuff floating around in the depths uh, in the deep dark uh, of, uh, oceans. And they'll reel those filaments in to sort of filter feed on whatever is around them. Vampire squids in general live in the OMZ, which is called the oxygen minimum zone. Uh, sometimes in the OMZ, there can only be 3% dissolved oxygen. So very little, uh, very few animals actually live in that area, uh, especially very few highly metabolic animals. So our vampire squids live down there and they use, again, these long feeding filaments. They'll kind of cast them out like uh, very thin nets to sort of collect all of that marine debris that's floating around in there so they can bring it in. Now, they also have these cirrha instead of um, two rows of, of suckers. 
And um, when we see them kind of turn themselves sort of inside out, like this one in the video is doing here, we can see those cirra um, quite easily. They're very uh, interesting looking and almost demo demonic looking. And that's actually where vampire squids get their name. So the, the, the um, scientific name for vampire squid is uh, Vampiratuthus infernalis, which actually translates to the vampire squid from hell, um, which is really unfortunate for these gentle filter feeding cephalopods because they're really not voracious predators at all. And they're actually not very demonic and they're actually quite small. So for scale, here's myself holding a, uh, a small vampire squid in our cold room. Again, you can see quite small. The biggest one I believe I've ever seen is maybe about the size of a football, but very beautiful, very interesting deep sea uh, species of Vampirotuthus infernalis. All right, so now we've gone through our, our eight-armed cephalopods, and now we're going to move on to the divisions of our decabranchs, our 10, our 10 appendage cephalopods. And our decabranchs have eight arms and then two feeding specialized feeding tentacles. This ram horn squid is probably one of the least known uh, divisions of the decabranchs, of, of these, of these um, soft-bodied coleos. And they do actually still have uh, a shell, a coiled shell, it's just internalized. So they kind of have the same thing that the Nautilus has going on with their external chamber shell. It's just been internalized for this, uh, this rare ram horn squid, uh, usually found in deeper waters, very rarely ever seen. Let's see, another group of our, of our coleoid cephalopods that's more well known as our sepia, which is our cuttlefish group. Sepias are classified by having, again, the eight arms and the two tentacles. They also have fins that run along the whole mantle. And then most importantly, they have these structures. Um, again, the modified shell has now become this internalized cuddle bone. You may have seen them in pet stores. They feed them to parrots and things because it's a very uh, calcium carbonate um, derived um, product for, for parrots to get their calcium from. And if you were to look at a cross section, which I've presented here uh, to you here of a cuddle bone, it's a very porous um, mechanism that they use, a very poor structure that they use as a mechanism to control their buoyancy. Um, and so they can use that along with their fins and their jet propulsion to kind of maneuver around in, in the water. Uh, some of our, our other species, like our flamboyant cuttlefish pictured here, um, they're, they, they utilize that cuttle bone uh, buoyancy only when they're ready to kind of evade predators. Otherwise, they amble around the seafloor um, using those, those modified club arms and the papillae on the back of the mantle. So moving on from our cuttlefish, we have our sepiolids. These are our dumpling squid families. They're very cute. They're very small. Um, typically, they're uh, a bit about the size of a golf ball or smaller. They have two kidney-shaped um, fins near their, their back end. Um, and uh, we work with this species quite a bit up at the Marine Biological Laboratory. They're, they're a really great Hardy species in aquarium and laboratory, a, a very cute little burying uh, couple species of pajama squids and hummingbird bobtail squids and things like this. And then lastly, we've got our squid group and um, our squids are our toothids. Our squids also have um, eight arms and these two feeding tentacles that you'll see fire out right now, grabbing that prey. Um, those are the same types of feeding tentacles that our cuttlefish, our sepia also use uh, when they're attacking prey. For our toothids, our squids here, their external shell, their ancient external shell has now been completely reduced into this thin, transparent, what we call a squid pen or gladius. And that's, you can see here in the middle picture as well. It kind of acts as more like a backbone providing some structural stability for that mantle more than any other uh, strong function. So those are our toothids. All right, so now we know all about our cephalopods. We've learned all about the different types of cephalopods. Where can we find cephalopods? Where you know it seems like all of you that um, are interested in cephalopods have here joining me to learn about cephalopods. Um, you know to go find cephalopods and to just observe them in the wild can be pretty challenging. Not only do you need to live by an ocean, but you need to go out in the ocean uh, during good conditions. You need to find these very cryptic, highly camouflaging animals, and it can be very challenging because we're uh, you know we're terrestrial animals. We don't belong there. But you're in luck. There are a, a number of different places that you can go observe cephalopods uh, in the U.S. and whatever country you're joining us from. Most, uh, you know, importantly, what you would probably think of is our various aquariums that are throughout uh, our countries and most and most every major city and definitely every state throughout the United States. Uh, there's a lot of um, cephalopod representation, 
And since our tentacles exhibition launched back in 2014, we've seen an even uh, larger increase of cephalopod representation in various public aquariums and um, science centers and things like this. So how do you find uh, cephalopods in your aquarium? Well, I would, um, I would encourage each and every one of you to visit uh, AZA.org. AZA stands for the Associations of Zoos and Aquariums. It's a, it's a governing body that provides accreditation to zoos and aquariums that provide really um, high quality care, um, enrichment, et cetera, for their animals. Um, and so you can be assured, rest assured that any animals being kept in AZA uh, accredited institutions have, have a very good um, animal care uh, protocol surrounding them and, and animal care team supporting them. And, um, and then just kind of visit the, the various websites of, of your nearby aquariums and you might find that there are, um, since our tentacles exhibit launched, there's been several other um, slightly smaller but also equally as interesting and, and impressive um, cephalopod based shows that have been launched like at the New York Aquarium, the New England Aquarium, the Aquarium of the Pacific, to name a few. So, um, so check out the websites, check your local aquariums, and you should be able to find some. And then as Sam mentioned, at, at, the, at the beautiful Shell Museum, there's also some live cephalopods there, as well as a lot of the historic kind of fossilized uh, representation with their, uh, with their shells. So uh, absolutely be sure to check out the Shell Museum in addition. And then research. So research is really important. We know that these amazing uh, animals are super uh, in, in, you know, impressive in a wide, wide variety of different ways. And so as a group, as humans, and as you know, uh, appreciators of life on planet Earth, um, it's good to know more about this supremely unique group of animals. And so it's important as a research lab and as, um, you know, as a culture facility, as we're, we're um, breeding and, and raising these different uh, animals to to look at and and to study in greater detail. Uh, it's important that we kind of understand why we're doing that. And so um, one of my final slides here is just basically kind of showing um, what makes cephalopods so so unbelievably cool, and why should we want to study them, and why should we want to just love and appreciate them as much as we all do. Um, well, I'm just going to kind of run through some uh, of their very impressive biological and physiological capabilities that kind of really um, kind of put them on the map and increasingly make them more relevant and prevalent in, in our day-to-day uh, -day lives. Um, so probably what cephalopods are most known for, as, as you could all imagine, is their unmatched ability to change the color and texture of their skin. Now there's no animal on planet Earth that even comes close to cephalopods with this cap uh, capacity, no chameleon, no fish, no anything. And they do this through the expansion and contraction of these tiny pigment filled cells called chromatophores that we can see in this little video. Now those chromatophores are expanded and contracted in this highly coordinated fashion to reveal these amazing color changing and camouflaging capabilities. Um, cephalopods don't have any audio communication so 100% of their communication is done through this external imagery and so those chromatophores are highly important. I need to take a second to remind you that this animal that we're looking here is again more closely related to a clam or a snail than it is to any sort of fish or vertebrate. So we really need to appreciate this absolutely incredible uh, ability to coordinate all of those color patterns in order to provide this type of communication, camouflage, et cetera. What else about cephalopods makes them particularly interesting? Well, they have by far the largest brain to body size ratio out of any invertebrate on the planet. They have these massive centralized brains, but also two thirds of the neurons are found outside of that large centralized brain. Um, in uh, the base of their arms, we um, jokingly refer to their ganglia as mini brains because they have these large ganglia at the base of their arms that allow their arms to uh, operate independently at times. And so there's other applications like looking at alternate ways to come up with artificial intelligence that's targeting cephalopods that kind of look at how all that neural circuitry works and how they're able to be such successful, uh, very dexterity uh, driven organisms, uh, even though they're, they're simple invertebrates that usually only live about a year or less. So uh, something that we're looking at. But what else about cephalopods is that they have very interesting behavior, problem solving capabilities, et cetera. Um, they have, you know, although they lost their shell, uh, most of them long, long ago, They've now um, gained the ability to have these types of interesting um, 
behaviors where they can even use other animal shells for protection, or they can use their interesting body forms to look like a walking a piece of algae or a walking rock or something like this to avoid predation. So that interesting behavior and social socializing between different cephalopod groups is also extremely interesting for research. They have a large, uh, uh, or they have large camera-like eyes again, um, like we do. They've got a, a lens that focuses an image onto a retina, and also the the largest eyes in the anim animal kingdom belong to uh, the colossal squid and the giant squid. Again, those large, exaggerated physiological and biological capabilities. They have non-deteriorating episodic memory, like other um, primates and uh, co uh, corvids, like uh, some of those intelligent uh, birds. And so that's very impressive for an invertebrate. They have massive nerves. So unlike other vertebrates, they don't have that, that uh, myelin sheath. So they have the, to make up for that by having very large nerves. So for neurobiology, that's a very interesting capacity as well. They have complete regenerative capabilities in, uh, in, the, in the case of some of our octopuses. This little octopus uh, down here is called Wonderpus photogenicus. It, it came to us as a septopus, probably lost an arm to a hungry eel. And after a few short months, you can see that that arm has now uh, started regrowing. In a few other months, it will be a uh, completely uh, fully formed arm as well. Cephalopods in general, uh, with their jet propulsion, are the fastest aquatic invertebrate. They've got soft but muscular bodies, so they can squeeze through holes, but they're yet incredibly strong. Um, the reason why I'm able to curl my bicep is because I've got two attachment points on my skeletal system. And by contracting that bicep muscle, I drive that locomotion. Our cephalopods don't have any skeletal system to speak of, so their locomotion is completely done with hydrostatic pressure in a, in a, in a completely novel way from us humans. So that's also a very interesting research application. They've got large but interesting genomes. Genomes are the total DNA makeup in an, in an organism, and we're just starting to learn about cephalopod genomes and finding some really interesting factors about cephalopods linking them uh, to other sort of complex vertebrates as well. And then lastly, they have immense RNA editing capabilities. So RNA um, basically is the building blocks for future DNA. It does a lot of other things as well. Uh, and us humans, we don't really edit our RNA um, and we're very inefficient at it. We basically don't do it or we'll maybe do it once over the course of our lives. Cephalopods do this hundreds of times over in their very short life as a, as a complete novelty. And what does this mean? We don't really know at this point. It may it may contribute to their success as, a, as, an, as an organism group, um, but we're not really sure. This is all hot off the press and we're just trying to dive more into figuring out what that RNA editing capability really means. So there's so much to learn about these amazing, incredible animals. They are really unmatched compared to any other animal, in my, uh, in my opinion, in the oceans or on land with their bizarre and, and incredibly gifted capabilities. And so as a group, I think we just need to kind of really appreciate them and learn a lot more about them. So what's next? Um, well, again, we're conducting a lot of really great research at the Marine Biological Laboratory here. We're promoting conservation, outreach, and appreciation of these great organisms through other public aquariums and other outreach centers. And so we're really excited to see where this, uh, this awesome, really interesting group of animals uh, goes in the future. You know, I think just the general public with this little invention called the internet, has really been captivated by, uh, by cephalopods and their capabilities. And so it's, it's really exciting to see the future and what's, what's in store for our cephalopods. And with that, I just wanted to uh, say a big thank you to, um, to Marine Biological Laboratory for being so supportive of, of my work and to be able to join you here today. Big thanks to Sam and uh, thanks to the Shell Museum. It was an absolute honor to be with you and I, I hope you uh, enjoyed all this information and, and all these cool facts about these incredible animals. So. Uh, thanks. With that, I'll take any questions you might have. All right. Thank you, Brett. Great, great, great presentation. Wonderful. Um, there, I know there's a there's a question or two in the chat. I, I had one before we went to the chat, which is um, kind of how are I know there are a lot of different a lot of different species of cephalopods, but how how are they how are they doing today? You know, from a from a are, are they thriving? Are there are there habitat issues? Are there, you know, is, is climate change having impact? Do we, do we have a, do we have a, a sense of, a sense of any of that? Yeah, no, that's a really great question, Sam. So um, a lot of the coastal areas where we're, where we're seeing a lot of very strong coastal development and things, 
There are a lot of issues with cephalopods in those regions, among other uh, marine organisms as well. Um, cephalopods in general, as a group in our, in our larger oceans, are doing fairly well, all things considered. Um, we do pose a lot of very strong fisheries pressures on our cephalopods. I forget how many millions of tons uh, the human species consumes of them every year, but it's, it's quite immense. It's, it's really impressive. So, um, you know, but as a group, because they're these short lived kind of live fast, die young lifestyle animals, um, they're actually a pretty good food to eat compared to eating something like, you know, a swordfish that may take 20 years to become uh, reproductively mature. A lot of these cephalopods are mature in six months or less, and then they're naturally dying in, in about a year. So um, eating adult cephalopods is probably not the worst thing for us. Um, we just need to pay attention to some of the kind of the coastal development pressures mm -hmm. and the de destruction of their habitat more, more than anything. Cool. Thank you. All right, so we'll go to the, the floor, as they say here, the virtual floor. Okay, let's see. All right, Rose had a question. Are there any freshwater cephalopods? Great question. No, that is one of the limitations of cephalopods. So they're basically like superheroes to me, but that is their kryptonite. You know, um, there are a very um, few, I think there's like one or two different species of cephalopods that have been found in sort of brackish waters, but there definitely needs to be at least a 50% salt kind of component, marine component for them to, to thrive and survive. Yep. All right. Michael has a question. How old does the giant squid get? The giant squid, um, I believe, is also about five years old from some of the post-mortem specimens that have washed up. But to be honest, we know very, very little about giant squids, colossal squids, uh, and a lot of our other massive deep sea squids because they're just so rarely observed. The oldest species of cephalopod that we know of on planet Earth is still, to this day, the nautiluses, which are uh, live about 20 years. Um, besides that, we've got giant Pacific octopuses that live three to five years, and I believe Archituthus, the giant squids, also um, when they when they look at the statolus and things like that, are somewhere around that five year uh, category. Um, but only in recent times have we ever filmed them alive in the past ten years. So this is all brand new. And sometimes when the you know our data that we're we're using um, are animals that are terribly damaged that are washing up or completely dead when they are washed up. So what happened to that animal to cause it to, you know, to decline like that and to wash up? And so there may be other physical reasons why they could be uh, getting older or even much larger than what we know of for our current understanding of, of our giant and colossal squids. Yeah. Thank you. From Olivia, do other cephalopods experience senescence? Yeah, so um, a lot of different cephalopods do experience senescence. It's just a bit more difficult to predict than with octopuses. So for those of you out there who don't know what senescence is, senescence is when, uh, typically reserved for octopuses, when they lay um, their one clutch of eggs at the end of their life, and then they undergo something similar what happens to us humans when we undergo neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's, Huntington's disease, dementia, or just general old age. So what happens to, to octopuses when they lay their eggs? Well, um, they become less reactive to stimulus in general. Um, their colorations are much more subdued. Their appetite decreases. They're less reactive to stimulus if you were to you know, um, interact with one or a predator were to come by. And again, a lot of similar things that would happen to us as we're kind of neurally declining. So from a research standpoint, that's really interesting because it's a highly predictable event. So we can look as a cross species comparison, we can maybe start looking at octopuses and seeing what's going on with their brain at these times when they're going through senescence and what can we learn from that to better uh, us humans? Because I don't think there's many of us out there who don't have a family member or someone uh, in our circle that has been uh, impacted by old age Alzheimer's or some other neural degenerative condition. So um, um, yeah, there are a lot of cephalopods that go through it um, is my general question, or is my general answer. A question from Jean. A number of winters ago, our beaches were littered with living octopuses inside pen shells. What kind of octopuses are these little guys? I haven't seen them since. Well, unfortunately, without knowing the geographic location, and even with knowing that, I would probably need um, some pretty highly detailed 
photos and things like of that nature. Yeah, my so probably, guess, it probably means here. Okay. Means, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So my guess is that that was probably um, as a result of some storm system. So octopuses in general are, are very vulnerable. This is why they have to be such so, so gifted at avoiding predation. Um, they're basically pure protein, no fat. Anything that can eat a little cephalopod out there is going to try to eat them. They're very vulnerable. And so often, especially at those younger life stages, they seek refuge in really, you know, great things like those, those shells that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And as they kind of bunker deep, deep down in there, they only really come out in order to find food in order to mate with one another when they become sexually mature. But otherwise they're basically, if they find a really good refuge, they're not putting themselves at risk too often to go out and explore until they get to a much larger size. Mm -hmm. So my guess is, is that you had a large number of octopuses on the coast and there was probably some storm or some large boat or something that came through there that disrupted all of those shells that were on the coast. And then when the tide came in, it deposited them and, and left all those octopuses in that shell, in those shells. That's what Where, I want. Am I right? Is Atlantic pygmy? Is that a, is that a kind of, there, a, yeah. there is an Atlantic pygmy there for what would be around you guys it would be Atlantic pygmy. There's a uh, Caribbean two spot. There's the, um, the Caribbean reef octopus, octopus briarius. There's a vulgaris, um, a, a, a general Caribbean octopus down there, octopus jubini. There's a few yeah. different ones, but there's actually quite a bit of diversity down in Florida, uh, which is why we'd probably need to see a photo to get yeah. it tried. Yeah. Well, I, I remember, um, I have no idea if this is the one that, that Gene saw, but in uh, this past January, for a really short period of time, for like, like a day, maybe two days, I think on just one section of beach here, which is called West, West Gulf, um, just hundreds or thousands of, of the Atlantic pygmy um, were on the beach, and it was just kind of like a, it was like a one-off. Um, yeah. yeah, so yeah. It, was a, it was cool. Okay, um, some more questions. Okay, this is a question we get at the museum pretty regularly too, actually. What are your thoughts about the movie My Octopus Teacher? Worth watching. Yeah, yeah I love it. Give it two thumbs up. <laughs> you know, I, I was nervous because I think a lot of times general public um, has a tendency to anthropomorphize, which is a fancy word for saying we try to make octopuses into humans. We want to connect with them so badly. We try to say that they're humans. But I thought that that, um, that documentary did a really nice job of, of respecting them and their world and just getting these little glimpses and little snapshots into that octopus universe. And, and again, appreciating it and then going back on, into our own terrestrial realm and, yeah. and kind of sharing it with everyone else. So, yeah, I would highly recommend that. It's, I think it's a great film. Yeah, it's certainly done a, a, a tremendous amount in, in just bringing a, a broader general awareness of, of octopuses. I mean, I, I really don't think there's a day that goes by at the museum where, where visitors aren't referencing the movie or, or asking about it. So it's, yeah. it's done a lot. Okay. Hmm. All right. Question from Audrey. How many cephalopods are there in comparison to fish? Just oh, Yeah. You know, that, that's a really good question. I, I am not an ichthyologist. Uh, unfortunately, I don't. I that's, don't a fish, like, that's a fish specialist. That's a, yeah, as a fish biologist. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really sorry. I wish I could answer that a little bit more accurately, but I'm, I'm pretty at this point in my career hyper focused into the cephalopod world. And I don't really know, you know, I, I, I do know that fishes in general are far more abundant across, you know, all different categories of fishes are far more abundant than our cephalopods. I just don't know what the numbers are and how, and how those compare. I, I, I apologize. Yeah. 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 No apologies necessary. How are cephalopods harvested for food? A few different ways. So primarily like the calamari that a lot of people eat, um, those often are done with trawl nets. So kind of understanding where squid spawning grounds are, where there are large quantities of these squids that are bringing in other predators like sharks, uh, whales, dolphins, etc. So understanding where those grounds are and during those times of the year, and then they bring these big nets and kind of trawl them up. Then there's other, um, for octopus fisheries in Spain, um, other areas in Europe, and even Hawaii, they do pot traps. So they'll send down different pots, um, which basically will mimic these types of shells that you guys have all seen these octopuses hiding in. They'll leave them for several days and then come bring them up similar to a lobster trap. And like what I mentioned earlier, where these octopuses really don't like to leave their 
their shell if they can. Um, they'll just kind of hang out there. They'll just bring them right up, look in the shell up, there's one, and, and, and then they'll collect it that way. And then the last way is with jigging. So some squid are jigged up with these little um, glowing jigs that you send down and they kind of mimics prey and the squid will kind of grab onto them with these little hooks and you can bring them in that way as well. So a few different ways. And then for us, we just collect them with soft hand nuts, you know, because we don't want to uh, injure or stress or anything to our cephalopods. So that's how we collect ours. Yeah. Yep. Um, Barbara asks, and you mentioned the giant Pacific octopus, I think living uh, lifespan of three to five years. Barbara asks, can you talk about octopuses you study who seem to live longer? Um, so those are the longest lived octopus that I know of. There's also another species called Grenolidoni, which is a deep sea octopus species. That's actually a little cephalopod interesting fact um, is that the longest incubation um, period out of any animal on the planet, again, belongs to the cephalopod, go figure. Mm -hmm. um, this Grenolidoni octopus will actually incubate their eggs for four and a half years, oh. uh, which is by far the longest incubation period. Um, and that, that it's theorized is that that long incubation will allow the little octopuses to emerge as basically uh, almost near adults. So they don't have to survive and find food in this desolate, uh, deep habitat that they're kind of already fully formed and ready to almost mate very quickly out of the egg. And so that species, I don't know if anyone knows what the total lifespan of that species is. It's a little bit over five years because obviously they incubate for four and a half years. Um, but those are the two old or like longest living octopus species that are out there that I know of. Um, the giant Pacific octopus cer certainly is the largest with an arm span measuring about 15 feet tip to tip. Uh, there's other unconfirmed rumors that it can get, you know, to 20 uh, feet, but the, the largest documented is about 15 feet tip to tip. Yeah. All right. Two more questions. One from um, three more questions. All right. Um, from Beth, how do cephalopods reproduce? Yeah, so, um, uh, so a few different ways depending on the cephalopod. Most cephalopod, like squids and cuttlefish, will actually uh, mate face to face, beak to beak. And they have a mod the males have this modified arm called the hectocotylus. One of their eight arms has a, a specialized groove in it that delivers sperm packets. And so they'll kind of mate uh, face to face. And then one of that, that specialized arm, arm will be inserted into the female's mantle, typically speaking, uh, and, and then drop off those sperm packets. Now, of course, there's exceptions to every rule. And sometimes they're, depending on the species, they're deposited around the buccal mass, kind of the mouth area, sometimes even on the backs of other squids. Um, and then for octopuses, they are, um, it's pretty dangerous to go mate face to face with another octopuses because octopuses, not only in the lab and in aquariums, but also in the wild have been documented and proven to be cannibalistic. Right. And so- um, this, is not a this is not a loving embrace. This is not a loving embrace, at least right. not for octopuses. <laughs> and so um, it's, it's, it's a bit risky. And so, um, and you also, for octopuses, they don't always know the sex of the other partner. So when you come across another octopus, you want to you know, get close enough to present your your hectocotyl arm, but not too close because if it's another male, they might be territorial and come out and attack you. And so it's this absolute, this um, kind of nervous sort of song and dance that a lot of octopus species will do. Well, they'll almost just reach one little exploratory arm into another octopus's den, see what the reaction is in order to gauge whether or not they should provide their, their hectocotyl that specialized arm or not. So I hope that answers the questions, but a, but a few different mechanisms for for cephalopod reproduction. And then they, they lay eggs after that. So some of their eggs are deposited on coral, on the reefs, on the undersides of things. And other um, like pelagic squids will have these large gelatinous sort of masses, almost like frog eggs that will float around in the ocean. So, and so quite a few different um, egg types and reproductive strategies for this diverse group of animals, yeah. Thank you. Okay, a question from Thomas. How many endangered cephalopods are there? Right now, there's only one that has been confirmed to be on the CITES list of threatened, and that's the Nautiluses. Hmm. Um, that was just recently um, added onto that list, I believe only about four or five years ago. Um, and that's because there's a lot of pressure on their shell trade. 
So if any of you out there are love cephalopods or inspired by cephalopods, uh, want to protect cephalopods, don't buy Nautilus shells. Mm -hmm. I know they're very pretty. That was that shell that I had on that earlier slide that has that nice chambered. Um, they're very beautiful. They're very decorative. But when you're purchasing them, those are coming from Indonesian fishermen who are pulling them up in, in um, inappropriate numbers to keep the species alive. Mm -hmm. And I understand the pressure for the fishermen because they need to have families to feed. And Nautiluses are really easy to, to collect for them. Um, Nautiluses in general are one of the few scavenging cephalopods out there. So if they put a bunch of dead chicken and other rotting meat in these large wooden chaps over in the Philippines and Indonesia, these Nautiluses will smell uh, that rotting food and go in there and trap themselves quite easily. And then those Nautiluses are unfortunately killed by those fishermen, uh, sectioned in half, and then sold to the United States and other countries as decoration. So just, I know they're beautiful, but that's just my little con conservation plug is that try not to buy Nautilus shells because you're furthering the destruction of that species. Excellent point. Thank you for, uh, thank you for making it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last question is from our own senior aquarist, Carly Hulse, who's been, who's been looking forward to this program and has been watching. And she's asking, and I'll preface this by saying, for folks who don't know, we have uh, currently three cephalopods on view or, or maybe Brett said this, um, on, on exhibit at the museum, the giant Pacific octopus, the two spot octopus and the flamboyant cuttlefish. The flamboyant cuttlefish, I should say, um, were, were, are descended from um, the original uh, flamboyant cuttle eggs, which we got from, from MBL. But um, Carly's asking, which cephalopod have you found to be the most difficult to care for? <laughs> oh man, yeah, that's a really great question. I would say probably, vampire squids just to do to the fact that they're so out of their element when we're trying to um you know keep them alive and and show them as an ambassador kind of to to showcase this bizarre and and rarely ever seen uh you know section of our oceans and so um i would say vampire squids but from any like i guess deep sea is sort of a, a obvious one so i would say any kind of traditional cephalopods um, more shallow water ones um, probably the pygmy, the Japanese pygmy squid was probably one of the more challenging. Um, they're really easy to care for and keep, but their reproduction was really tough. Um, their, their little babies are, I literally, you could, um, keep one in a drop of water and you could see them swimming around in, inside of a drop of seawater. So that one I think would be the most challenging shallow water cephalopod I've worked with. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Brett. You are obviously a, a terrific ambassador for and um, representative of the, you know, of, um, of the cephalopod cause and, uh, and a great communicator um, on the subject. And we've learned a lot and um, the chat's lighting up with uh, all kinds of thanks and accolades. So thank you again for joining us and for, for the presentation. And we look forward to continuing to work with you. And uh, thanks, thanks for all the work you do with, with all kinds of organizations. And um, everybody, thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, this talk will be available after tomorrow, um, recorded on our website. Um, we're actually gonna uh, blast it out by, by email to our email list on, uh, on Friday. So if you get it and wanna forward it to anybody, that'll be an easy way to do it. And um, have a great evening and uh, we will, See you next time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.